Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us on R. Kelly Appeal TV. This is the Solar Coaster series, and we're going to be moving into the fourth podcast, and we're going to be reading from the autobiography of Diary of Me by R. Kelly. This is where his memoirs sit. And I am putting this together specifically to look at the lifestyle that R. Kelly endured as a young man and how that, and based on what he had endured, how it affected and impacted his young adult and adult lives. So let's get into secrets. As a kid, I had a lot of secrets. Some were terrible, some were beautiful, some were both. There were so many secrets to stuff into my imaginary box that I was running out of room. The first secret was the sex. I couldn't reveal it because of the rule against snitching. I had a feeling my mother wouldn't play no secret shit. No way, no how. Meanwhile, though, odd things were happening in my body. I was confused by it. I was dying to tell my mother, but I was scared to death about what would happen if the real truth ever came out. One secret was about what was happening to me in the house. Next was my secret about reading and writing. And the third secret, strange as it seems, was music. I would hear music like I had a radio playing nonstop in my head. Sometimes it would switch stations. Every now and then, it would play one song and then sometimes before the song even ends, another one comes in. I would hear melodies, although I never knew what they meant. In fact, I thought everybody heard the music. If I was at school and it was time to read, I'd put my head down on the desk and drift off. While I was drifting off, though, music would start up so heavy and loud that it felt like my head would explode. I'd pick my head up to see if everyone had heard it, or if I'd say to another kid, hey, did you hear that? They'd look at me like I was crazy, and that just made it worse. So see, he was going through a lot of psychological um, consistencies in his head, blocking things out. Um, and there's a, there's a mental health um, term that is used for that. I can't think of it right now. But that's where I'm going at here. Like the dyslexia is taking place. Moving on. It was another problem that I put in my brick box because I didn't want everyone to know. And I was afraid about what would happen if they found out. It was one of the scariest times in my life. I couldn't figure out if I was sick or retarded or dying or if there was just something really messed up about me. My mother always taught me that too much of anything can kill you. So I used to worry about too much music happening inside of me. Was it an overload, an overdose? I couldn't really tell anyone how music would leave me alone, how music wouldn't leave me alone. No one except maybe my mother would understand. As a kid, it was easy, even too much for me to understand. I was writing songs before I even knew what songwriting meant. Just as one melody came pouring out, another one interrupted it, and then another, then another. And then all kinds of harmonies, all kinds of notes coming from everywhere, ideas, thoughts, endless songs. It was beyond crazy. I didn't want to tell anyone what was happening inside my brain because I couldn't explain it. My brain was overcrowded. Music was overwhelming me. I wanted to be happy, wanted to please my mother, please my teacher. I wanted to be like other kids. Instead, I was stumbling and falling down over words while melodies were pouring in and singing inside my head. Here's another thing. Even though there were times when the sheer volume of music inside my head had me thinking I was an alien, there were even more times when music comforted me ministered to me, gave me life because I absorbed music like a sponge absorbs water. I couldn't help but soak up every thirst quenching drop. Picture the porch in front of our three flat on late afternoon in summer. Sky clear, weatherman, mom out there with Lucius, Uncle Doug and Uncle and Uncle Cuz. 
I never did know if the man was my uncle or my cousin. <laughs> Picture the neighbors dropping by, caught up in the sound of the, re the radio floating on air. Now hear the sounds, the Isley Brothers singing, drifting on a memory. Ain't no place I'd rather be. The groove so free and easy that you had to sway with Smokey, soft and warm, a quiet storm, or Frankie Beverly when the sun settles down and it takes a lovely form. That's the golden time of the day. This was music from heaven, music without pressure, pure magical music, May sing and shine, children shine. And mom sang, swaying along, arms outstretched, if you believe in love, shine. That unforced, free-flowing, syncopated, sweet sound of voice, horn and bass, made everything seem all right. It took the sting out of life. It was nothing but sugar and cream, nothing but clouds floating on a breeze of love. Music said, music said life for all the strife could be heaven on earth. If only we listened to the singers and the songs they sang. Watching them listening to Teddy Pendergrass or Donny Hathaway, David Ruffin or Eddie Levert, Etta James or Curtis Mayfield, I started dreaming this dream. I imagined that one day people would be relaxing on their porches listening to music that I made, songs that I sang. One day I prayed I could take the pressure off and bring the calm to folks like Mama and Lucius, like Frankie Beverly and Mays. One day I'll be able to lay down grooves that would make people happy, loving. I create music from the heart that touches the heart. In the world of music during the 1970s, Chicago soul was like an ice cold pitcher of sweet tea, known for its blend of Southern and gospel soul, backed by sweet harmonies and horn and string arrangements. Chicago soul was a po as powerful music coming out of Detroit or Memphis, record labels like OK, Chess Records, Wonderful, and Chai Sound promoted artists like Jerry Butler and The Impressions, The Dells, Etta James, Shy Lights, Curtis Mayfield, and Gene Chandler. Sam Cooke, that's the most loving man you'll ever want to listen to, Mom said. He was her favorite singer by none. Sam Cooke was raised right here in Chicago, she boasted. Not only was Sam a soul music pioneer, mom said, Sam was a businessman who owned his own record label and publishing company. He came out of the church, she explained, but took the church with him. That's why you hear God in every note he makes. Ain't no one like Sam. Even though I was only 10 years old, she strongly urged me to study this man. You learn him good. There were two sides to him, and you best learned them both. When he was with the soul singer singing gospel, and when he started singing pop, no one could touch him, baby. Each side of that man's music was as good as the other. My mother and I listened to Sam Cooke for hours on end, whether it was touch the hem of his garment or you send me, whether Jesus wash away my troubles or twist the night away. Near to thee or Cupid, he'll make a way. Or I love you for sentimental reasons. Joy, joy to my soul or change gonna come. I could hear the church echo in Cook's silky voice. His soulful confession helped me understand what I saw at home in church on the streets of South Chicago. I understood sorrow with chain gang, dreamed of giddy love with Cupid, and enjoyed finger popping with Twist in the Night Away. Listening to Sam's cooked music wasn't enough for mom, though. She wanted to make sure I truly understood his ability to manipulate lyrics and command each genre. No matter if it was a bluesy ballad, soul felt gospel, raw rock and roll, or funky theme and blues. Hear him bend that note, baby, she would say. That's his specialty. Singers are like great chefs. They got their specialty. Some can bake pies, some can, can fry chicken. You'll find your specialty, sweetheart. And when you do, the minute you open your mouth to sing, folks will know it's you. Meanwhile, listen to the chefs, learn their recipes. My mother considered Stevie Wonder a master chef. The first Stevie song I learned was Fingertips. When I got older, she took Stevie's Master Blaster cut and taught me how to memorize every last lick, every breath, every riff. She placed a nickel on the record player 
needle to slow down the revolution so the runs could go really slow so I could learn them and get them down pat. Joanne Kelly and Stevie Wonder's mother, Lula Mae Hardaway, had a lot in common. Lula Mae all also recognized her son's musical gift at an early age and nurtured his genius. Stevie was barely a teen when his mother heard him repeating just like a slice of lyric, here I am baby, here I am baby. It was Lula Mae who supplied the hook, signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. Stevie's mother was by his side when he signed with Motown in 1961 and she helped him write hit records such as I Was Made to Love, her you met her match you oh you met your match and i didn't know why i love you soon i was sounding like stevie then stevie same was true with marvin gay i could sing what's going on or let's get it on with that marvin like attitude mellow but intense i could fix my voice like donny hathaway mom made sure i knew the songs of the older cats like jackie wilson and ray charles at christmas time it was all about nat king cole I was born into the perfect musical storm. Everything that mom loved, I loved. From Billie Holiday to Dinah Washington to Aretha. I soaked up everything she had soaked up. She loved Frankie Lemon and Lyman and the teenagers. But when Michael and his brothers came out with ABC and I Want You Back, mom was loving that just as much. When it came to music, the woman had no prejudice. Her musical history became my history, like everyone else in the hood. When we saw a new history in the making, we jumped on board that musical change. When the Sugar Hill Gang started singing about hip hop and the hippie and the hippie to the hip hop, you don't stop in rapper's delight, we were euphoric. Those were early jams, Curtis Blow's 1980, The, the Breaks, which was the first certified gold rap record. The Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five's 1982 Game Changer, The Message, which is regarded as one of the greatest songs in hip-hop history, had us young kids dancing just as wild and free as when mom and them were dancing to James Brown. Like Tarzan in the jungle, learning how to take, talk to the animals and swing from vine to vine, I learned to talk to music. I learned to swing from one musical vine to another. I heard every sound there was to hear, and I could make every sound that I heard. I grew up in a place on a planet where music, beautiful music, God's music, the people's music, my mother's music spoke to me every minute of every day. You got that gift, boy, my mother said. You got that talent. But how could a talented person have such a terrible time with simple reading? Didn't that prove that something was wrong? Wasn't that something I had to hide from the world? And what about what was happening at the house behind my mother's back? Were good little boys supposed to be doing the things that had happened to me? Shouldn't I have tried to stop those things? Shouldn't I have stopped gazing at those women running around half naked? Shouldn't I have stopped taking Polaroids of people doing the nasty? On the solar coaster? On the solar coaster, a talented kid with too many secrets did his best just to hold on. How were we living during nine and 10 years old? Was this something we were experiencing? Was this the norm in our culture, in our homes during this time? The parties, the, the music extensively, the secrets. What were, think about it, but we don't have to share it with the world here on this podcast, just think of the secrets that we held. Devotion. One afternoon after school, I was walking home, glad to be out of the classroom when I heard a song blasting from our front porch. It was called Kung Fu Fighting. That song always made me happy and seeing mom and Lucius on the front porch drinking their Millers, I could see they were getting happy too. They were dancing and hugging like newlyweds, carrying on like they didn't have a care in the world. But then Lucia said something to mom that she didn't like, and suddenly things started to change. Didn't take much for things to change when mom and Lucius were drinking. 
Now, mom was cussing out Lucius. Now, Lucius was cussing her out. She said, I ain't going to take that. He said, I ain't going to take that. My mother ran in the house. He followed her. She screamed at him to get out of her kitchen. He said, screw you. My little heart started beating because I was scared that something bad was going to happen to her. But Joanne Kelly was straight up tough. The woman could take care of herself. She was out of the kitchen and back on the porch. Lucius closed behind her. Get out of my face, mom warned Lucius. Kung Fu fighting was playing over and over again. The record was stuck. I ain't going nowhere, yelled Lucius. She ran back in the house. When she came out again, she was holding a heavy glass mug. Put a hand on me and I will F you up, she threatened. Who you going to F up, B? Lucius ta taunted before grabbing and twisting her arm. Um, with her free arm, Joanne whacked Lucius across the head. The mug split open and cut his forehead, blood gushing out everywhere. Lucius staggered, fell, passed out con unconscious. My mother ran to him screaming for me to call 911. A neighbor called the police. By the time the cops arrived, Lucius had come too. What happened, they said. Lucius hesitated. I was shaking because I thought they were going to take my mother to jail. Lucius looked at the cops and said, I drank a few too many and fell down the stairs. That's all there is to it, asked the cop. That's all there is to it, said Lucius. That was the day that I fell in love with Lucius. Two weeks flew by. It was a Friday night and the rent was due. Mom was short on cash. Lucius supposed to pay his share, but he wasn't home. He'd gone out with the boys. My mother convinced the landlord to give us another week. I was glad because I was tired of hopping from house to house Every time our money was funny, we called the landlord the monster. Seemed like the monster was always on our tail. Saturday came and my mother was still looking for Lucius. She was boiling mad. Sunday we went to church and when we got back, Lucius was still a no-show. Mom was boiling even more. Monday evening he showed up. Where you been, she asked, out. Any fool knows you been out, but out where? Don't matter, said Lucius. You're right, it don't matter. Long as you got your rent money. I don't. What you mean I don't? Can't you understand English woman? I don't means I don't. That ain't gonna cut it. Gonna have to. Give me your share of the rent. Can't give what I don't got. Besides, I'm tired of talking. Lucia stormed out, but Joanne wasn't letting him off that easy. She wanted her money. She reached for his wallet. He pushed her away. She scratched his face with her fingernail. He kicked her, then ran out to his car. She ran after him. Lucius got into his car and slammed the door, but my mother's dress caught, got caught in the door. Lucius took off, dragging her down the street. Me and my brother Bruce chased the car, jumping into it, beating on Lucius to stop. The car stopped. Mom was banged up and bruised. With all the screaming and carrying on, somebody had called the cops who arrived soon after. Who hurt this woman? They wanted to know, looking at the black and blue marks up and down my mother's arms and legs. No one, she said. I just hurt myself. Cops looked over at Lucius. Sure, you don't want to press charges? They asked. I'm sure, she said. Mr. Blue. In one of the neighborhoods where we lived when I was a kid, there was a man named Mr. Blue. My mother always liked him because during the summer he put up, put us in his car, drive us out to the country and show us how to pick fruit. Mr. Blue bought us skateboards and bicycles. Mr. Blue was cool. On this particular morning, Mr. Blue came by, saw that I was by myself and told me to come over to his place. I followed him over. When we got there, he said, help yourself to the watermelon in the fridge. The melon looked good, so I helped myself to some. Meanwhile, Mr. Blue went to the bathroom and took a He then came out, and as we know, this is an explicit part of the book, so I won't read it. But um, at this point, he was insinuating that he would give money for some performance, some sexual performance. But before Mr. Blue could say another word, I was running out the door with his voice trailing after me. He shouted, if you know what's good for you, boy, you won't say a nothing to no one. Say a word and I'll cook your, your goose. Later that night, I was talking to my good friend, Sam. The thought of what happened with Mr. Blue was bothering me to the point where I couldn't think of anything else. I was scared to say anything, but I just couldn't hold it back. Hey, Sam, I whispered, if you if I tell you something, promise you'll never tell anyone. OK, it's about Mr. Blue. Sam immediately cut him off. You, too. 
he asked. Sam told me that Mr. Blue had tried the same stuff on him. We vowed never to say anything to anyone. Wow, some of the men that were in this area, and, and, and even to this day, there are still creepy crawlies like that just everywhere. And it's, oh. A month later, I was putting together another cardboard house in the backyard. This time I got real curtains. I got it tricked out so pretty, I wanted my girlfriend Lizette to see it. Your playhouse is like a real house, Rob, she said. We sat on a little rug I put over the grass and pretended to be watching a TV that wasn't there. We pretended we were married. Lizette kissed me on the cheek. I kissed her back and the puppy love started to grow. We were both 10. That night I dreamed of Lizette. We lived in a house like you see on television with a white picket fence, a backyard, and a swimming pool. Afterwards, we were riding in my fancy car to a fancy restaurant where the rich folk eat. I woke up happy, beautiful dream, beautiful Lizette. I had an idea for my playhouse. I decided to take some cushions off mom's bed, put them on the grass, and pretend it was a couch. Me and Lizette would sit on the couch together and act like husband and wife. The pillows were pink, Lizette's favorite color. I grabbed the pillows and carried them outside. When I got to the yard, I saw that the playhouse door was ajar. Even stranger, I heard Lizette's laughter and playful voice. When I looked inside, I saw my friend Sam on top of Lizette, kissing her and trying to pull her pants down. Get out of here, I screamed at Sam. Get away from my girl. But Sam wasn't budging, and neither was Lizette. I couldn't control my fury, so I jumped on Sam. He was stronger than me. He pinned me down and gave me a good licking. To retaliate, all I could do was scream at the top of my lungs. You told me not to tell anyone, but I'm telling everyone. I'm telling how Mr. Blue messed with you. You said it was a secret. But it ain't a secret no more because I'm yelling it out. Mr. Blue mess with Sam. Mr. Blue mess with Sam. Mr. My sister heard my screaming and told my mom, who was shocked. She didn't know about Mr. Blue. She called the cops and they showed up at Mr. Blue's door. We never saw the man again. Okay, that's enough to dissolve <laughs> in our minds today. Um, so I am going to start podcast five with jump shot um r kelly went through a lot he was only 10 i mean and i'm getting tired of all the abusive opportunities that was afforded to this young man this young boy no one should have to endure that you know let alone someone who's not being overseen by anyone of responsibility um Wow. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Do you believe that these situations that happened back then was a reflection of how he saw life as R. R. Kelly, the superstar with all of the women, all of the opportunities? What are what are your thoughts? So we'll continue on with the podcast number five shortly.